think every town and city in America has a pizza place, probably many, but some people call it pizzeria. But if you go up north or in the uh, Midwest or uh, the Northeast, especially those cities, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, New York, those kind of places, there's literally a pizzeria on every corner. And they'll always have kind of the same sign outside. It'll say, the best pizza in town. It's a, it's a bold statement. But it shows that it's probably good food because they're competing with each other. But there's a story of a pizzeria named Louis. And Louis was out in a boondock somewhere, some, some country, small town, but it was the only game in town. And one day a man walked into Louis, and he walked in and he noticed that the tables were kind of dirty. So he went to the bathroom to get washed up, and he noticed that the bathrooms were not clean either. Sat down, looked at a menu, and noticed the pizza was expensive. Small pizza, $25, $30. And the food was bland, and the waiter was rude. So the man called the manager over, the manager of Louis, and said, you know, told him, this, this is dirty, this is not good, the, the pizza is expensive and it's not great, and your, your waiter is rude. To which the manager responded, you know, we're doing okay, we're the only game in town, and, and then he gave him that powerful question, who do you think you are coming in here to question me on how to run my restaurant? And the man responded, I'm Louie. This is my restaurant. I own it. I've been gone for a few months, and look what you've done to it. My name is on the moniker outside. That's why I'm fired up. That's why I have zeal. I love this, this word that's used in the gospel. Zeal for his house consumes me. And what is zeal in Greek? Zelos. We get the term zealot. And what Webster defines as a great passion with great energy. And to respond to that, that powerful question, who do you think you are? He knows who he is. So today we get to reflect on, I think, some powerful gospel passages that we really should be familiar with as Catholics. The first one is the Ten Commandments. Where are they at? They're in two places in, in the Bible. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. Two lists. They're a little bit different, but the same, but the same covenant. And we're all somewhat co familiar with the Ten Commandments. They're a good tool to use when we're about to go to confession in a practical way. Read through them, pray with them, say, Lord, what, what have I been guilty of? But I think it's also good to look at Exodus 20 and remember the context how this was given to Moses. And hopefully somebody in here has seen the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston or even the cartoons because it does a pretty good job. Moses is on the mountain, on Mount Sinai, and with thunder and lightning, God carves out the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the covenant with the Israelites. But what's ironic and intention is while he's carving those marble tablets the Israelites are breaking every commandment on there. They are worshiping the golden calf at that very moment when God tells Moses, you better go down there because they had defiled themselves. And that masterful scene when Moses comes down and they're worshiping the golden calf, he says, this is the word of God. And you're breaking every, every commandment here. To which some of them, not all of them, reply with the same question. Who do you think you are telling us how to live and who and what to worship? This is when we get to see Moses with his zeal, with his passion. When he says, those of you who are with God, come on this side and those who are not, go over there. He has zeal for the word of God and he recognizes and the Israelites recognize that Moses have a, has authority and has been sent to give his word to the people, his covenant. 
I am this for you and you are this for me. I drew you out of Egypt and set you free. And these are commitment, commandments to keep you free. These are commandments to keep you free. And if you've ever taught your teenager how to drive, telling them what those yellow lines mean, what that rail means, not that it's constricting your freedom, those expectation laws, precepts, is so that you get where you're going, you enjoy the ride. So now we're into the gospel. Again, we have our Lord walking into the temple. Now, he does this several times that we remember. Jesus goes in as a baby to be circumcised. He is there again, causing trouble when they find him as a 12-year-old, and here he is causing a lot of trouble. And it's a reminder to us, and I think, again, us as Catholics especially, that the temple is very much represented in the book of Maccabees, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. That's only in the Catholic Bible. It's not in the Protestant Bible. And what is the Maccabean Revolt? What is Hanukkah? It's not just this nice Jewish celebration where you light candles and eat certain food. No, it's about the cleansing of the temple. The temple has been defiled. And Judah Maccabees and his family go to war with the pagans to cleanse it. To get rid of all the pagan statues and they come in and they wash it and it's protected. And those, they light those candles for eight days. That's what Hanukkah is. It's the cleansing of the temple. But here we go again. When Jesus walks in there. And it's good for us to know this Bible passage too. It comes in handy. When someone ever says, you know, what would Jesus do? Often we heard that. To remember what he did do. He put some rope together. Start tossing over tables. Start running them out. And said, get out of here. He recognized they were in a holy place. His father's house. And it was being defiled. They were cheating people. They were not being respectful. And they didn't recognize him that he embodied the law and the prophets. And just like Moses, and just like the manager at Louis, he asked that famous question, who do you think you are? Give us some proof that you have some authority here. And it gives us, him, and the church a chance to tell people who we are, who he is. Because I think when it comes to zeal, when it comes to zeal, I think we could always do better. Are we passionate about our faith? Do we have energy? And do we remember that our very bodies are tabernacles, the church is a tabernacle, and the sacraments are meant to help cleanse us and keep us cleansed? Now, it's ironic because this past weekend, Deacon Tim and his wife and their team had a whole weekend preparing couples for marriage. Not a marriage retreat, but these are for engaged couples. They spent Friday night and all day Saturday preparing for marriage. And one of the things we asked them to do is be students of marriage. Have energy. Feed it. That it is a grace and that they're sent on mission and to have zeal and energy about their marriage and to what real marriage is. Because it's worth fighting for. And it needs us like Jesus, like Louis, like Moses, for us men to stand up and defend it. And you find out real quick when you get the most return fire is this issue of marriage. I was... Looking, working on about 17, 18 years ago. When I was recently ordained, I went back to Mexico to work on my Spanish. And they had these little schools where you're in there with all kinds of people. So I was in my class, and this couple sent, came, sat next to me. And after a few days, we got to know each other. I found out one of them was Catholic and one of them wasn't. So I asked that question, are you guys married? I wish I would have kept my mouth shut. Um, no, we're not really married. We're sort of married. It's like being sort of pregnant. What do you mean you're sort of married? 
Well, they're legally married, common law marriage. And so, as a young priest, with my zeal for my new priesthood, I said, you know, you have a higher chance of divorce if you're living together and contracepting. You have a, boy, I, should, I could approach that better. <laughs> and even though I wish I could get that back, I didn't turn over any table. But I do remember the response. Hey, we don't need any piece of paper, any church to tell us what marriage is. And then the question came. Who do you think you are, celibate boy, to tell us how to be married? This is when is our chance to recognize the master. He teaches us how to be men and women of God. He teaches us about marriage. He teaches us about zeal because he had zeal for us. And then we're not talking about a pizzeria anymore. We're talking about the household of God and our faith in that Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And do we say that with zeal and energy? And when someone asks us, who do we think we are? To be able to answer whose we are, who we belong to, who they belong to, who wants them, who wants them to be married forever, and to recognize that they're sent on mission, but it has to be cultivated. Marriage, my priesthood has to be cultivated. I told the couples last night, Bishop Amon told us kind of in a private session that every once in a while a priest will come to him and want to leave. He said, you don't want to leave the priesthood. That happens. And the first thing Bishop Amon would ask them is, when did you stop praying? When did you stop saying your office? When did you stop praying with the scriptures? And usually they have an answer for that. Same thing when a couple get, wants to get divorced. Sometimes we'll ask them, when did you stop talking? When did you stop praying together? When did you start living like us roommates? Because usually an answer for that. They lost energy and zeal about their marriage. They lost energy and zeal about their faith. And that's always a loss. But Jesus comes to show us his zeal for us. So in this time, remember that our very bodies are tabernacles, our temples, and we have tools to keep them clean and to be zealous about it. We offer confession here on Friday nights, and Father Vincent and I will stay in there until people stop coming. Take advantage of that on Saturdays and Wednesdays. But there's lots of churches around here that have penance services, that, and you can always... Make an appointment. Father, I need to go to confession. I love doing that. It gets me out of finance council meetings. <laughs> now, I know that people here in the finance council, God bless you. Thank you. God, thank you. But I have a degree in philosophy and PE. It's not my area. <laughs> but remember that we have our own tabernacle and have a zeal for it. And to be careful what comes into our tabernacles, what comes into our houses, whether it's TV, radio, or your computers. Be zealous about what you allow to come in. And when everybody, anybody ever asks us, who do you think you, we are? We can tell them whose we are. That we belong to him and he belongs to us. And he, this being a Catholic and, and a Christian is not who we think we are. It's who we are. No, we are. So have some energy and be a zealot about that.